Well, I want to welcome everybody who's going to be watching this uh, to a very special event. And it's uh, myself, David Nathan, uh, known in certain circles as the British Ambassador of Seoul. And uh, I am delighted to be talking about one of my absolute favorite <laughs> subjects of all time, which is Miss Aretha Franklin. And who better to talk with about Aretha Franklin than with one, two, three, four, five, six, I have to keep, make, make sure I've counted correctly, two, three, four, five, six ladies who spent some time with Aretha during, during many years as publicists with Aretha. They are collectively known most suitably as Aretha's Angels. And I am delighted to be talking to Aretha Frank, Aretha's Angels today and to be sharing our experiences of working with Aretha and getting to know her and, uh, and, and just to set the, kind of set it up for everybody. Um, my first uh, experience with Aretha was in 1966. Now, I know some of you weren't born in 1966, or you might have been very, very <laughs> young, but I was a teenager in London. And uh, I was so moved by hearing Aretha's voice because, you know, back then her records were not released in, in Britain. She was on Columbia Records. She wasn't with Atlantic yet. And she was not really a mainstream artist. And um, I was so moved by hearing her voice, I decided to write a letter to her. And of course, back in 1966, how are you going to write a letter from London? So I sent it to her. I sent two letters. First one I sent was care of her father's church. So all it said was, Miss Aretha Franklin, care of Reverend C.O. Franklin, New Bethel Baptist Ch Church, Detroit, Michigan, USA. Because we didn't have things like zip codes. You know what zip code was in London. So, and I hoped she would get it. And then nothing happened for a while. So well, maybe I should send a backup letter. And I had a, a promotional photograph from uh, CBS Records in London. And it had the address of manager on it, which I didn't know at the time, manager was also her husband. So I sent this letter <laughs> and lo and behold, three months later, my dad calls me uh, from, the, from the shop that he's working in down, says, so David, David, letter from America. So I come rushing up down the <laughs> stairs, look at the letter, oh my God, this is a letter from Aretha. And you know, it was so, and everyone says, would you still have the letter? Well you know, 1966. If I had known then what I know now, of course, I would have framed it. But I was just beside myself. The fact that she had taken some time to write. She said, I don't know how any fans in England. Well, of course, she didn't at that point. So <laughs> nobody barely knew her. She had York was out in England, really. Anyway, but it was, she said, well, I hope to come to England and thank you so much for writing. And then later that year, I spoke to her as my Christmas bonus. I called the, uh, through the international operator and called and spoke to her. Uh, I remember, you know, the operator put the call through to Detroit and Ted White answered the phone. He said, who's calling? He said, David from, from England. And so he, I said, can I speak to Miss Franklin? And he said, he put the hand over the phone. He said, um, Aretha, phone from London. And she came to the phone and she said, I've never spoken to anyone in England before. And I said, well, I'm David, I'm, I wrote to you and you wrote back to me. I just called to wish you a Merry Christmas. And she was like, thank you. And she was so quiet, you know, very quiet. And, and she said, oh, I'm, I just signed to Atlantic and I'm going in the studio. And I said, well, I can't wait to hear your music because you had to keep your call short. And so that was my introduction to wow. Elisa Franklin. And uh, I feel very honored that the way my life has developed from being that fan in London, writing that letter to all the decades of doing interviews and getting to know her to the point where I could honestly say she had, it has been and was, and I still think of as being a friend. Yeah. So with yeah. that, with yeah. that as my background <laughs> to tell you who I am in relationship to Aretha and why she's important to me, I want to welcome Aretha's angels. And um, these are the ladies, as I say, who've worked with Aretha from 1985 to 2018, the esteemed publicists. So let's start with Tracy Jordan. Hi, Tracy. Hi, David. Hi, Angels. 
Hey guys. Yeah. Hey. And then uh, next it, next up is Jackie Reinhardt. Hi, Jackie. Hello. Yes. <laughs> and then Audrey. Now, Audrey, I'm going to have to say your whole your. Please say name. your full name, Audrey. <laughs> Well, my maiden name, which I used when I was at Aristotle, yes. Lakatis, but then my married name, even though I'm no longer married, but is Onyike. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Audrey. Thank you. <laughs> and LaJoyce, LaJoyce Brookshire, or Shire uh -huh. or Shear? Shire? Shire. Correct me, Shire. Okay, the correct pronunciation. So LaJoyce Brookshire. And then, hello, say, say hello, LaJoyce. Hello, everyone. Hello, Hi, hello. And nice then, um, Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn Quinn. Hi, Gwendolyn. Yes, hi. Yes. Hello, everyone. And, and I just yes. wanted to say, and, and I wanted to add this because Aretha yes. knew about the angels because I told her one day mm -hmm. I had showed her a picture. It was, it was Jackie Reinhardt and I, someone else. I can't remember. And I told her about the angels. She said, she laughed. She said, I'm really the angel. <laughs> <laughs> well. said, I'm really the angel. <laughs> yeah, that was. I'm glad that she she um, she signed off. She approved of the angels. So good, that was good, good, good. Oh, and, and finally, the, the angel yes. ets. <laughs> and, and finally, we have one 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 other lady to introduce, which is Robin, Robin Ryland Sanders. Hi, Robin. Hey, Robin. All right. Hey. So uh, we we're going to uh, start out, and we can start out by talking about um, what your first reaction was when you met, met the Queen of Soul, and do you remember what impression you got of her in that first meeting? And we're gonna do it in the sequence in which you all worked with her. So Tracy, you're up. What was it like the, when you first met Aretha? What was your reaction and what was your first impression? The very first time I met Aretha, I was about 15 years old. I was friends with Calvin Lockhart's son, and um, he said, like, oh, come on, we're going to go over to my friend's house. And his friend was, was, uh, was Teddy. And we went to Aretha's Brownstone on the Upper East Side. Mm -hmm. And um, I had no idea. I walked in, and I, she came out of the kitchen yeah. with her, like, apron on and stuff like that and looked at me <laughs> like, you know how Aretha, when she first meets you, she gives you that, she used to give you the once-over, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> who are you why are you in my house why are you around my sons where do they know you from like the whole 20 questions and I was just like you know awestruck I was just like I had no idea we were going to her house and, oh, wow. and you know it was just amazing hmm. the first time I worked with her was uh at Arista I guess it was like 1986 latter part maybe the beginning of 87 um, and I went to Detroit for the video shoot of Jumpin' Jack Flash. Yes. And yeah. Keith Richards, Ronnie wow. Wood, uh, Steve Jordan, uh, Aretha, uh, Abby Conowich, Jane Rose, who uh, managed Keith Richards, were all on set. And I walked onto the set, and Aretha <clears throat> was seated behind the piano, and she had her hair like it was like the Patti LaBelle days <laughs> where it was sticking up on end. Blue black lipstick, a spaghetti strapped uh, zebra cat suit, and um, she was at the piano, and I was like, "Oh my god, how am I going to tell her that? Like, she needs like I don't know something else. Something is missing." <laughs> and I had never like I had she didn't remember me from like when I was fifteen, but I just walked over to her and I was like, "Hi, Miss Franklin. I'm Tracy Jordan." Because I had spoken to her on the phone, and I was like, "You know what? You really need to set this outfit off is like a leather jacket." And she looked at me like, <laughs> you're going to tell me about fashion. And like, I ran over to Abby. Abby gave me his credit card. And I went to like Wilson's house of leather and suede and bought like five different jackets, brought them back to the video shoot. And she selected a, like a motorcycle jacket. And she put that on, rolled up the sleeves and the outfit was complete. And I have, I don't know if you oh, guys wow. know, oh, wow. but that's oh, her, wow. Keith and right. uh, Elliot Laurie and Jane Rose over here, and Keith in the middle. And then um, Aretha's brother, Cecil, was still alive at the yes, time. Yes, and yes. 
he and Ronnie Wood and Keith and Steve Jordan all disappeared into like the trailer of the Rolling Stones trailer doing God knows what. I don't even want to know. Um, but like we went on from there and that was like my first time. And then she called me on the phone and, you know, she, you know, as she would once you were her publicist and, with, and left me this message. And I got home from, from work and, you know, put on the answering machine and there was Aretha Franklin. And I was like, oh, my God. And I pulled it out of the um, answering machine and I still kept it to this day. So wow. 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 Amazing. Amazing. Wow. Amazing. Wow. That's quite a story, Tracy. That's quite that a story. Is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Well, next, uh, Audrey. So tell oh, us. Jackie. Oh, Jackie. Jackie. Sorry, Jackie. 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 You're next. So Jackie. Yes. So tell us your first impression. The first time you met Aretha, how did you respond? And what was your first impression? Ah, the first time I met Aretha. Actually, I wish I'd had my picture in front of me, and I, and I will get it at some point in time so that I can show you. I did happen to have, have a copy of that um, because I rarely took photographs with the artist. But I did at that time, I remember because of the necklace I, I had on, which had cowbells on it, and it would <laughs> ring all the time. But I needed the <laughs> ringing because Aretha was traveling from... Uh, her home in Detroit <laughs> on the bus, of course. And, yes. um, you know, Arista is located on 6 West 57th Street. Uh -huh. So we were in a very, she, she part of town in New York City. But what was interesting was that when she arrived, it was truly like she arrived with her court because we were all waiting. You don't know what time she's going to get there. So you're anticipating, you actually have a lookout, almost like a century. When is Aretha arriving? You don't know. And remember what time this is. So we don't even have cell phone in that sense. Right. So um, she's arriving. And um, when she comes, of course, and she gets off the bus, uh, she pulls up right in front of Arista, however. Wow. You can't park in front of Arista, but the <laughs> whole bus just comes and it stops there. And everybody, uh, eventually everybody gets off, but Ar but first Aretha gets off and she comes out, you know, uh, she's got on her flip-flops and shorts and she comes in and she comes into Arista that way. So that was my first meeting. I said, oh, she comes with the crew, the camp. I mean, what would, what did you, when, when you actually got to like shake her hand or say hello to her, how was it oh, for actually, you? Actually, not only did I shake her hand, uh, it's interesting because she did not feel, um, in my first impression of her, I didn't feel this uh, detachment. I really felt very, very comfortable with her because right. the photograph of her and I is, uh, we're hugging. And okay. I think that's very odd, you know, and Aretha's yes. just standing there and I'm yes. just hugging her. So she's, uh, <laughs> I didn't feel detached. I didn't feel that from her. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Brilliant. She's brilliant. Happy. Brilliant. I, mean, I love these stories. They're just really great. All right. So after Jackie is Audrey. Audrey, your first impression, you know, when you, your first reaction and then your first impression. Well, um, so Jackie had booked her on the Phil Donahue shows, but I was there to execute it. So I had to go over to the Plaza Hotel to pick her up and ride with her down, you know, to the, to the taping. And she comes downstairs from the, the, her room and some of her folks were already down there. And she comes over to me and she, she's like, hello, and very polite. And, you know, her very, says, oh, I like your coat. I was wearing just a, you know, basic off the rack wool coat. She had on a table. And I said, I like yours. Want to trade? And she said, you know, like, not even. <laughs> and we laughed. And we kind of set the tone. And then um, in the car, uh, that set the tone for our humor, which, like you said, a lot of people don't realize that. Aretha was funny. But in the car, we get in the car, and I'm pinching my Avenue in a limousine with Aretha Franklin. It, it doesn't get any better than this. And she asked me, she goes, so Miss Audrey, I hear you're from Detroit. And so that advantage of, of that Detroit connection. So we bonded right away and we had a great working relationship. And, you know. uh, great, 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 great. All right. Well, now, uh, now I'm looking at my little, uh, yes. Yeah, so next is LaJoyce. LaJoyce, you and yes. Aretha, tell us about the first time you met. What was your impression? How was it? 
The first time that Miss Aretha and I met was actually thanks to Jackie. And here is the photograph. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And this was actually that's probably 1989. Wow. Yes, Jackie? Yes, that, that's it. Because that's when my photograph is taken to uh, that day. Yeah. This day. Okay. <laughs> I was a writer and producer at Sheridan <laughs> Broadcasting Networks. And Jackie mm -hmm. calls us up, Miss Aretha is coming and you all get over here and come and have some lunch and champagne with her. And we dropped everything. It was a production day <laughs> and everything. We dropped everything and ran over to Six West because who's gonna say no to that opportunity? And here's my proof of that day. And we, as you see, she's, she's smiling as mm -hmm. am I. And it was something funny about the Midwest that we spoke about. I'm from Chicago. And I said, Detroit and, Mid and Chicago, same camp. She said, you know, it's same camp. And I said, I have family in River Rouge and we come skating over there. She said, oh my God, River Rouge. That's probably when I took the picture. But I, from the onset, I recognized her to be so comical. Yes. Very quick. I mean, quick witted. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and that weekend, there was a concert at Westbury Mu Radio Music City Hall. Radio City Very Music City Hall. Musical. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we went to the show and went backstage. And I do have that picture somewhere else in my house. Yes. And moving forward from there, though, but when I got an opportunity to work with her, mm on the very first day. Are we going to get to this or should I just move on from here? No, you keep going. Can you talk about okay. how, when you first started working with her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite by accident. There was, she was about to get a gold record mm -hmm. for one of her projects and we had an all hands on deck event and I'm just in the department at this point. I'm not her publicist, right. but you know, the queen comes to town, the entire building works. Yes, ladies? Yep. The entire yes. building works. <laughs> And so this was a grand affair and we were going to be coming from Carnegie Hall to the Harley Davidson Cafe downstairs that we had secured for her after party. And so we're all standing around kind of ch chatting, doing nothing. And then somebody says, the queen is coming, the queen is coming. And so we all <laughs> got to attention and I put down my champagne glass on a table. And then when she comes through and we step back, you know, it's like parting the Red Sea. And I step <laughs> back to let her through <laughs> and my butt hit the champagne on the table. <laughs> <laughs> fell to the floor in front of her feet. And she stepped back just in time. She had on this gorgeous baby blue satin gown. I'll never forget it. I helped her gather the gown and <laughs> step over the champagne, snap for the waiter, get over here, clean this up, move the crudite from one table to the next and sat her down. And then, you know, she immediately went to eat, of course, because, you know, that's what we do. And she was the, but she was eating from the crudite tray. And the photographers wanted to take a photograph of her. And I was like, no, you do not take a picture of the queen when she is eating. And then I got to work. And then I got to work the next day. And our, uh, our department Whoa. head called me in and said, Miss Aretha called Mr. Davis and requested to work with you. I was like, I spilled champagne at her feet. What are you talking about? <laughs> I could not believe it. I couldn't yeah. believe it. And then it was just on and up from there. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. All right. That was great, LaJoy. That was really that was great. great. I, I, I could see the whole thing. I know all <laughs> of us can actually see it in our mind's eye. We truly can. All right, so Gwendolyn, 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 how did you I really to meet with Miss Aretha Frank, meet with and work with Aretha? Actually, I don't have anything that exciting because honestly, I don't remember when I first met her. I know okay. that I replaced Aretha with Jackie Reinhardt, but at the time, LaJoyce was there. I was joining the department. LaJoyce was already okay. there and she was already her publicist. But, but being friends with Jackie and then working in the office with LaJoyce, I just felt like I already knew her because Jackie yes. would talk about her all the time. And then LaJoyce would like, Arisa's on line three. It was just a very chaotic environment. But so that's what I remember mostly. But she remembered, she told me one day, she said, I remember when I first met you, Gwen, when she said you had really, really short hair. And she said, Clive introduced us. So wow. it was for some event. I don't even remember at that point in time, but I stayed at Arista for like five years. And then at the Arista, I started my own PR firm. So I lost contact with her for maybe nine months or so. 
Mm. So she called and said, Gwendolyn, I heard you started your own firm. She said, um, I think I may sign with you. And then that's how it all started, wow. you know, from Aris. And then, you know, when I worked at her at GQ Media. And then she said, well, give me your paperwork. <laughs> she said, fax me your paperwork. Give me your price. So I did. And she called me back. She said, I can't do that price. She said, this is what I can do. And um, so that's how it started. But I honestly don't remember the first time um, I worked with her at Aris. I don't remember what event it was for. Right. But did you yeah. remember your first impression of her? Like when you first met her face to face? I mean, I know from my own experience of seeing other people meet Aretha that many people go into like this place of awe. They can't quite get it together. Mm -hmm. And they sometimes they stumble over it. They just kind of like, oh my God, this is a legacy. This is a legend. This is an icon. This is the queen of so. I mean, how was it for you when you, when you first actually came face to face with her and said hello? I wasn't. I, I, honestly, I think the, the benefit of Jackie telling me all these stories and LaJoyce, I just felt like I, I knew her already. You know, yeah. I just I didn't feel like nervous or anything like okay. that. I just rolled right into, um, you know. I knew she didn't like people gossiping and talking. I knew that, you know, mm -hmm. say less, saying less is more, you know, is better yes. off. And yes. yeah, those yes. little things I picked up, but yes. no, I wasn't nervous. Mm, okay. Not at all. All right. Well, now we go to Robin. Okay. All right. Well, we will continue on then. And she'll, and, and we'll ask Robin to join us once she gets her, that all sorted out. So the next thing is, Gwendolyn, you tell, you want to know more about, um, I kind of told the story a little bit about how I first um, you know, got to interact with Aretha, but uh, uh, why do you, do you want to talk to me about my first time actually meeting yeah. her? Yeah, yeah, David, I, I was just so, I knew that, um, you know, Aretha and I talked about you a lot, and she she really had high regards for you, and definitely considered you a friend outside of being a journalist, mm. but I was just floored when, um, I found out how long you guys knew each other. I was like, <laughs> I was a little girl at that time. And um, so, so share yes. with us, I mean, because I think all of us publicists have worked with you at some point, you know. That's true, absolutely, um, absolutely, 100%, you know? yeah, yeah. And um, so share with us some things like we don't know about her, like back then at that time. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, that, that time that I spoke to in December of 1966, she was just about uh, getting ready to go into the studio for the first time for Atlantic. I didn't actually um, have any conversations with her in that first year, because I was aware of what she was doing. And I wrote some pieces about Aretha for different magazines in London. I, I think I, I did write something for Blues and Soul. Um, and um, just to kind of, as an aside, uh, that the word got back to, to Jerry Wexler that I had written these articles and I guess the person in London had sent him to, the Atlantic person had, had sent the articles to him. And so one day I get this package in the post from Jerry Wexler and he says, thank you so much for promoting Aretha in England, you know, and he sent me a copy of her then new 45 was a promo copy on Atlantic, um, baby, uh, I love you. And I thought I, you could not talk to wow. me at that point. No one could, I, I was like, I can't, I mean, you know, just trying to get the, the, the scenario. I was, I was, how old was I? I wasn't even 20. I was 19. I was 19 years wow. old. And, get it, and getting that, that from Jerry West was amazing. So and then I fast forward to the next years when I actually met Aretha. So they set up this European tour. And um, uh, the person at Atlantic in London was a lady called Janet Martin. And she said, well, Aretha's going to be arriving from Gat at Gatwick Airport, not Heathrow, because she's already begun her European tour. And um, so she'll be coming from Sweden. So I went with my sister, uh, Sylvia. We went to Gatwick. They told us when to get there. And we arrived at the, at, at the Gatwick Airport, which is not a big airport. It's not as big as Heathrow. It is now, of course, bigger. But anyway, so... You know, she comes through the, the, the arrival hall with Ted, Ted White, her sister Caroline, Carolyn, Carolyn, and her two other background wow. singers. And Aretha was short. I mean, I didn't realize, because never seen what she looked like in person, that was, she was short. I expected, I don't know what I expected, but she was quite short. You know, and Ted White was this like six foot person. I'm like, oh, hello. Anyway, so I say, you know, I go up to her and I say, 
hello, hello, Miss Frankel. I'm, I'm David Nathan, and you know, I wrote to you, and you know, blah blah blah. She says, well, so, and I, I must have said some flowers, and we gave her the flowers, and I said, well, welcome to England, <laughs> and she said, well, thank you, and you know, I've met Ted White and, and sister and everybody, and uh, and then you know, they kind of ushered her out, and then the next thing was uh, when she had she did a concert, uh, she had a few concerts in London. And I took my mom to see Aretha. Took my mom and my sister to see Aretha at the at the Hammersmith Odeon, and uh, the people were going crazy because all we knew about Aretha was she was, you know, this amazing. You know, she hadn't had many hits in English. She had Respect and a couple other things, but we didn't. You know, she wasn't as well known as you know, say some of the Motown artists at that point. But there'd been a lot of like hype about her, a lot of press about her, and so on. So the place was full and I turned around to my mom and I said, uh, so, so what do you, what do you think? You know, cause my mom hadn't been to any concerts. <laughs> she said, well, she said, um, cause she had heard her in the household. She couldn't help but hear Aretha's records. And she said, well, she, she reminds me of, of that gospel singer, Mahalia Jackson. And I said to my mother, I said, what? Cause I looked at my mother like, wow, I was shocked, you know, that she would know have that connection. I said, well, actually, Aretha grew up, you know, listened to Mahalia Jackson. I said, Mahalia Jackson actually was almost like a second mother to her. Uh, and, and so then we went back afterwards. We went to the, uh, we didn't go backstage. We met Aretha at the, at the backstage door. I introduced her to my mom and my sister. And she it was just, she was just really charming. She was actually completely, honestly blown away by the reaction of the audience. And I'm gonna say something that may sound in these days and times slightly politically incorrect, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Aretha had not, of course, this is the first time in Europe, had not played before an audience that was primarily white. Mm. I mean, you know, people don't kind of get that in context, but really she hadn't. I mean, she had, yes, obviously, as she became more popular, the audience widened, but at that point, you know, she's in front of, a, you know, a primarily white British audience, and they were reacting to her just as enthusiastically as the audiences in America. And that, I could tell, you know, that really made a big impression on her because she yeah. realized her music was transcending, you know, culture, race, and everything. And, and it really made a difference. And she, one last thing to say about, about that first visit, she was, I, I co-owned a record shop in, in the middle of London, uh, you know, uh, it was called Soul City. And, and we got the word that Aretha, she, we told her about, I told her I had a little record shop and she, we got word that her and Ted were gonna come and visit the record shop, right? So we wow. stayed open late, you know, cause we said, well, we, you know, just for Aretha, you know? And then we were sitting there waiting for her to, to show up. I'm like, oh my God, Aretha Franklin's gonna be at the shop, you know? And then we got a phone call saying, well, unfortunately, she's not coming. And I just crushed, you know, but, but my first impression, that was my, my first impression of her was she was just very polite, gracious, and, and, and just thrilled, really, you know, and we have to think about her age, you know, she was 1968. She was, uh, you know, let me see, do some little math here. She was uh, 24, no, not 24, she was 26 years old. So, David, do you recall the... Do you recall that, lad, like, from that year, 1968, when did she yeah. stop traveling to Europe? I mean, yeah. had you, yeah. had she traveled several more times? Yes, 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 yes. yes. In, in, in fact, in fact, display item, Aretha Franklin at, uh, at, at Hammersmith Odeon. Uh, this was from 1970. Wow. And that was the first time. So she did continue traveling. She uh, performed in Europe quite a number of times through the 70s. Um, and even the, the last performance that I'm aware of, uh, one of the last performances, was after she signed to Arista, she did um, a, 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 a royal command performance for the Queen. Actually, I think it was the Queen Mother. I don't think the, I'm not sure the Queen was there for that one. But um, yeah, so she, she performed for the, the, at the royal command performance, which was a big deal. I mean, you know, for any artist to perform there, and she sang Amazing Grace, and one other song, wow. one other, the other song. I wasn't there for that, but I do know about that. So she actually uh, continued traveling to Europe. I think that might have been one of the last times, and that was 1981, actually. So I okay. don't know that she traveled much. I, I think that might have been the last time. I don't. I don't recall uh, that she came here. Much, it came to to Britain after that. 
Could that have okay. been before no. or after the plane incident, which stopped her from flying? Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, uh, I, I do want to share one more thing with you about this. Uh, this cover story. So this was not meant to be a cover story. This was not meant to be a cover story. What happened was, so this is this is when my uh, relationship with Aretha really developed as more of a kind of personal relationship. So she came to London in 1970 to um, to do some shows. And that was the time she had the record out, Don't Play That Song. And she was booked on some television shows. And um, I found out from the Atlantic person where she was staying. And I sent some flowers to a hotel. And uh, I, I called up. And, and she was traveling at the time with um, a, a lady who worked with her, who was part of Ruth Bowen. Ruth Bowen was her agent. And Queen Booking, which was amazing, you know, was the first booking agent, booking agency owned by an African-American woman. And so Aretha had been with mm -hmm. her for a long time, even up to that mm -hmm. point. And um, so this woman, LaRue Manns, was with Aretha. And um, uh, she had just had a baby. Aretha just had Kelf, her son, her last son. And um, she um, walked through the top of the pops, you know, entrance mm -hmm. to the BBC. And I didn't even recognize her because she had mm -hmm. so changed how she looked. She had, the, she had Afro. She was. She, she was lost weight. I mean, she looked, I mean, I didn't even, I, she literally walked by, I didn't see her. So then I found out she was there and she put my name on the list. And so I knocked on the door and, and, and you know, LaRue answered the door and I said, well, she, who is that? I said, it, it, it's David Nathan. And so she'll come in, come in. So I just, I just was chatting with her. It wasn't an interview. I was just like, oh, how, you know, how are you doing? Oh, I just had a, I just had my, you know, a, 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 a baby and, I'm feeling good, you know. I'm, I'm I'm so happy to be back in in Europe, and and she was doing some other shows in, in in Europe and talking about her new album that she was doing, which was ended up being the album Spirit in the Dark. But it was a very kind of casual, you know. It's really great to see you. And then I watched her go out of the dressing room onto the set of Top of the Pops and sit at the piano, and it was like this woman who I'd just been chatting to. This young woman who I just been chatting to sits down at the piano and plays "Don't Play That Song," and it's like, mm -hmm. who is this? I mean, it's like, wow. I mean, that kind of going from the conversation to seeing her in action, and the all the studio audience—they were like, you know, and what can you say? I mean, it was just really amazing. So, so that was when I felt like I really connected with her personally yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Oh. Now, Robert, are you okay. back with us? Nope. No. 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 Robin, you are on mute. Can she probably can hear us? Tracy said, "Call in on your cell phone," but we can't hear you. So there's a mute somewhere. So um, put on your headset, Robin. Put on a headset on. and plug in. You also might need to go to video settings and, uh, and turn up your volume. Yeah, Tracy is a pro <laughs> at the Zoom. I see, I see, yes. <laughs> Come on out, Tracy. She is a pro at the Zoom. Well, um, exactly, right. that's how we do all the interviews. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, well, while we're, while we're awaiting Robin fixing her, her, her uh, connection, let's talk about... Um, some of the memorable moments, a couple of you already mentioned particular moments, but I'd like to, to, to hear from you, you know, uh, what you know, some of your memorable moments and, and really kind of getting to know Aretha, just any, any kind of memories, any, of course, we'd like to focus as much as possible on the humorous moments. I have some too, which will come <laughs> later, but let's hear from you about some of the moments that are not necessarily always humorous, but really memorable for you about your years of working with Aretha. Any, anyone can go, whoever wants to go. I go. have one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I have one, and this is pretty uh, fresh for me right now because I just brought my mother home to my home from Chicago, and I'm hoping she'll stay. You all pray for me. And mm -hmm. I had taken, I we had gone to Detroit, Miss Aretha and I, while well, she was there. And I met her there because we were doing a live recording at her church. Mm -hmm. And my mother came. I got two tickets, for, well, four tickets, actually, for my mother and my cousins in Detroit. And the show was about to begin. And 
I was with my mother in the audience and backstage, Miss Aretha had asked for me and then someone came to get me. And they had told her, she's talking to her mother, I'll go get her. And when I got backstage, yes, Miss Aretha. And she said, your mother's here? And I said, yes, she said, go get her. And I said, okay, I did, I plan to once the show is over. And she said, no, go get her now. And I thought, uh, okay. Like, all right. And so I went to the audience, got my, I said, well, she's with my cousin. She said, go get them. And I got them all <laughs> and came backstage. And she told me, offered a seat to my mother and my cousins. And she sat and spoke with my mother like she did not have a show to do. Wow. And I, all I could do was wait. I, well, I just guess I'll wait. Wow. And I waited for her to finish. And then she asked my mother, where was she sitting? And my mother said, oh, you know, like row, whatever she was sitting on. And she whispered to someone. And then they came and got my mother and put her on the front row. Wow. Mother sat. Wow. She was just that kind of gracious. Yes. That something that my mother never forgot. Oh, and yes. she, she spoke to my mother about me. And they spoke about me my mother told me and I which I thought was really pretty interesting it's like you know my mother was a teacher you know you feel like you're being called summoned to a conference that's <laughs> what I thought <laughs> you know but it was that was one really memorable yeah gracious moment that I'll never forget that's beautiful that's really beautiful and it really kind of talks to what my experience of Aretha was as well and probably for all of you you know that she really valued family and she valued mm -hmm. you know just that kind of yeah, that was a, a characteristic of her that was really important. I mean, just really. And so, yeah, that I can, I could totally get that. Like, mm -hmm. act, yeah, I bet your mother, your mom was probably like, just, just, you know, over yes. the moon. Yes. <laughs> over the moon. I, I have something similar yes. to that. Yes, Audrey, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aretha had an album out and, you know, getting her into New York to do press was an ordeal because she didn't mm -hmm. fly. We had to really... Mm -hmm take advantage of the time that she was there. So she was playing a concert at Westbury Music Hall, which is out in Long Island. It's quite yes. far. It's a beautiful theater in the round. And so I, I chartered a bus, hired a driver, catered the ride out there, had food and champagne and everything for all the journalists. Had the journal, It was packed. We get out to the venue, everybody enjoys the show. And I had arranged with Aretha that she would just do a quick meet and greet with everybody, at least, you know, say hello, get a picture. And then, you know, we would follow up with some of the phoners and the interviews, but uh -huh. it was just important to get that personal connection with the journalist. And so, you know, after a show you're tired, but you know, she, she just, you know, and at, at this stage in her life, she wasn't, you know, she's probably in her fifties. I can't do mm -hmm. the math either, but you know, she was very gracious. And there were two people there that, that I remember distinctly. One was a woman named Mrs. Neal that was Clarence Waldron's teacher. And Clarence mm -hmm. Waldron, of course, was an editor at Jet Magazine. Absolutely. And, and also a huge Aretha fan as you are, David, and somebody that, that she liked a lot. And yeah. he asked me if I could invite his teacher his, you know, uh, to go uh, join the concert. And, you know, mm -hmm. even though she wasn't a journalist, I was like, oh, well, of course. And she was the loveliest woman. And I introduced her to Aretha as Clarence Waldron's teacher. And she just, I mean, it was just, the, it was beautiful. She was so kind to her. And she was like, well, I love Clarence. So you must have done a great job wow. teaching him, you know, et cetera. And, and that uh, meant so much to her. She talked about it all the time to Clarence for years. And then mm -hmm. there was another journalist there who brought his mother, Ken Simmons. You guys all know Ken Simmons. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And, I mean, she was, he was, she was so nice to Ken's mother and they took pictures together. And um, I remember when Ken's mother passed, I sent condolences to him and he said, you know, I'll never forget that moment when you let uh, my mother come to the show and it, she mm. never forgot that. And it was one of the best times of her life meeting Aretha. And that's how yeah. she touched people. So, it, you know, everybody likes to talk about Aretha, the diva, and she's difficult and all that, but they didn't know the real Aretha. Exactly. There were sides of her uh, that people, not just her humor, but her grace and her kindness. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and she didn't take any mess from anybody, be clear. Right. But, you know, I I always defended, we were all, all of us here were all very, very protective of Aretha. And there was, yeah. you know, my opinion, and I, I stood by it throughout my years working with her was, you know, when you get to her stature, not only of the success that she had, but, you know, you got to add the talent on top of that because the talent yeah. alone would have should have demanded all the respect in the world. But the, the, the talent, 
her commitment to civil rights and, and the, her accomplishments in that arena, the success that she had as a recording artist, you pile all that together. Yeah, if she says, turn the air conditioner off, or if she says, fetch me, but that's just, you know, she, she earned it. And all mm -hmm. the crap that she had to put up with, you know, from racism and, you mm -hmm. know, in the sixties and touring. Um, yeah. Give her her flowers every freaking day. Yeah. So you, couldn't yeah. Tell me, you couldn't talk to me about Aretha and criticize her or say anything diva ish or, or anything. You would yeah. catch, you know, you yes, Audrey. Absolutely. Yes. Tracy. Yes. Give us a um, brief anecdote. <laughs> so that was awesome. That was awesome, Audrey. That, really that, yeah. that was so. That was so well said. Um, my story goes back to uh, the time when Aretha was not traveling, and we had to do all of the publicity run at her house. So I would be going to Detroit. Now my mom is from Detroit, so I have family there, but I would have to go to Detroit to do everything. So it just got to the point where Aretha was like, you know, you keep coming back here and the hotel is like an hour away. Why don't you just stay at the house? I mean, there's another bedroom upstairs. You can stay up there with Carolyn. And I'm like, sure, bet. So Carolyn and I were like cut buddies. And Carolyn, Aretha had quit smoking and she had quit drinking. So you couldn't smoke or drink in the house. And of course, Carolyn and I were like the dynamic duo of, uh, of trouble. And it was like, we would wait, we would take beer and we would put it in the freezer downstairs. We would wait and listen for Aretha to go to bed. And then we would sneak downstairs, get the beer, go upstairs, smoke out the window. And um, one night uh, we were doing that. And all of a sudden we heard boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Carolyn, Trace, what are you all doing up there? And we're like, holy shit. So we, <laughs> so we grabbed like the 12 by 12 album covers and we're like, you know, fanning the smoke out the window, throwing the beer cans away. She never came upstairs. But what had happened was, when we opened the window, we set off the alarm, which was only in her bedroom. And we didn't know that. So that was crazy. Um, then another, another story was we did the One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism album yes. cover yes. and the recording. And I came up with an idea to have uh, Norman Parkinson, who at that time was the royal photographer, do a photo session with her at New Bethel Baptist Church. So we get all the outfits and all the clothing and everything like that, and we set up the shot. And Norman Parkinson pulls out this like child, children's like desk that you would see in a school, and he puts it under the neon cross and everything in the background. And he goes over to you know he goes over to Aretha, and he was like, "All right, Aretha, I want you to jump up on this desk." And, look at the shot. <laughs> and I'm looking at him like. There is no way in heck that she is going to be jumping up on that like little <laughs> dude. Just forget it. Well, you know, jump to it. She was up on the desk in a oh, second, oh, and wow. that's how you know we got that album cover uh, photo. That's but amazing. she was, you know, she was just so so special, and people didn't know her generous side. You mm. know, when I was when I was sick, and I had nobody would give me a job. She gave me a job. And Gwendolyn and I were going back and forth uh, because we didn't even call it getting fired anymore. Like Hilton Kincaid would say, you're not getting fired. You're going on vacation. Just think of it that way. So it got to the point where Gwen and I were like, okay, I just got, I, I'm going on vacation. She's going to call you. And then Gwen would call me back. And we would just like go back and forth like that for like, I don't know, like five years or something. Um, but she knew that I was having, she knew I was having financial difficulty and she yeah. was there for me. And she yeah. was always there for the yeah. underdog. That, that, that's something that a lot of people don't know. That's true. Well, yeah, I, just that's very, one, I, I just want to add one thing, Tracy. I, I was actually there. Uh, you, you actually were the publicist when I was uh, doing, uh, I came to the uh, New Bethel Baptist Church, Baptist Church for that recording. And in fact, I had a Blues and Soul Award that had been specially made that I was supposed to present to her and she knew about it. And then it was supposed to be on the last night, whatever night it was supposed to be. 
and, and she forgot because she got so caught up in everything. So I'm sitting there with the award waiting for my cue to be able to go up there and, and, and present it and tell the world, tell the congregation, everyone that how Aretha was an international artist and all that. And she, it just didn't happen and I was crushed. But then I remember you took me backstage and we, I presented to her backstage. And of course, there is a photograph somewhere of her accepting the award. And But yeah, but that was an incredible, incredible experience. And I'll just say one more thing about that. The fact that I was in that church, the same church where I had written that letter in 1966. Mm. I mean, that kind of, it just blew my mind to see Aretha on, you know, you know singing in the church that I've written to her at so many years ago. Just to, so, you know, just singing in that in, in that environment. So, yeah, I, that that's my that's my memory of that particular occasion. All right. So, who who who's up next? Who wants to share a an Aretha memorable? I'll go week? Next. I love these stories. I'll go next. I love these stories. I'll go, I'll on, go next to piggyback off of what um, Tracy yeah. said. You know, that was a really interesting time. With Tracy and I was going back and forth like that. But she was so generous. You know, when my father died. I mean, before my father died. I mean. My father and Aretha shares the same birthday, March 25th. Really? Wow. Yeah. So one day um, I got her to call him and that was really, really special. I mean, I mean, she would do things like that. I mean, and, you know, she had a concert one year. I can't remember the year, but I was working at, um, I, would work, I was working at Arista at the time at Radio City Music Hall. And she thanked, you know, she did this typically with some of the other publicists as well. You know, she would thank us in front of the audience, have us stand mm -hmm. up, put the spotlight mm -hmm. on us, you know, take you to the Kennedy Center, shout you out, and just mm -hmm. say really, really wonderful things, which was really, really rare back at that time. Yeah. I mean, she didn't have to do that. She's a huge international star, mm -hmm. but she really did appreciate us, you know, in that way. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she did that for a lot of us. And it was just, you know, and when, you, when I think back now, I was like, wow, you know, um, that was really special to me. Those moments, the gifts that she was sent, you yeah. know, around these holidays or just if she's ordering, you know, she used to like to order a lot of things, um, not so much online, but she would send you, you know, boxes of steak and seafood and things like that. It was just great. She's great yes, like that. Yes, She's yes. Really wonderful. All yeah. right. So, so Jackie, do you have any anything any any particular memorable funny <laughs> moment? Or Jackie, you gotta different? tell the elevator story. Oh, 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 the right elevator there. story. Okay. Oh, yeah. I found the picture. Can you see it? That's the day we met. All right. Yes. Um, <laughs> She's short, and you can see how classic. short Aretha was. Classic. You know, classic. I was just thinking yes. really why probably people felt uh of that way about Aretha was she was surprisingly normal. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the comfort <laughs> level, that's how I felt about her. I didn't really find anything. Uh, if anything, she was very, very normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more so maybe than other people would think, and maybe yeah. even more so at to her detriment in the sense that, you know, we know Aretha loved her soap operas. We knew what time not to call <laughs> because of that time. That's very, very normal. Um, you knew that when Aretha would arrive, she would arrive dressed for comfort more than anything else. Um, so all of those things, I think, made you have that kind of impression about her. But mm -hmm. um, one of the stories that I have, of course, is that w when uh, we were doing, um, as Audrey was saying about getting her press done, it was often uh, difficult to schedule. And it took a lot of uh, coordinating because she didn't come in at a scheduled time. She was on her own in terms of uh, her mm -hmm. travel. So she may have stopped at uh, the mall on her way in, or they may have decided <laughs> to go get barbecue when they should have been arriving an hour Walmart. before. <laughs> yeah, or Walmart. So that anything could happen on the road. So you don't really know when she's coming. So all of that adds to the hype of, oh, the queen is here because when she finally gets there, um, that's how we're all waiting for her. Um, at any rate, uh, that was a situation when she was uh, doing the JVC Jazz F uh, Festival. And so the uh, concert was at Carnegie Hall. And what happened was, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's my house phone. Uh, so what happened was she was, uh, 
she was scheduled to come in and it was one of those situations where she had made me find out about the air condition in every level of the hotel. <laughs> and I had arranged a mini press junket in the sense that there was NBC, <laughs> there was WBLS, there was CBS, there were uh, quite a few outlets uh, going to be scheduled to do interviews in a round robin way on one floor of the hotel. Mm -hmm. So she made me actually measure from the front door to the elevator, how far it would be that she would have to walk through air condition because I could not have asked the hotel to shut down the air condition in the lobby. Now the floor that we were buying that could happen. So um, I had that pretty much arranged and undercover at any rate, when she came, uh, she came to the, uh, I got a suggestion from a girlfriend who was a producer at, uh, ETV, public television in South Carolina. And she said, take her through the kitchen, Jackie. And I said, that's an excellent idea. I'm going to take her through the kitchen. So she didn't have, I didn't have to concern myself about the front door, the lobby, the uh -huh. air condition, because she had threatened that if she came through that front door, through the lobby, and the air conditioner was on, she would turn back around. And she would have left the hotel. So mm -hmm. I took her down. I was, I mean, really, I was in a flux about how am I going to get her through here? And so she said, take her through the kitchen. So I was able to do that. And I told them, bring the limo to this side of the hotel and we'll take her through the side door. So we took her through the side door. We're getting in the hall. Everybody's ready. Her security is moving. And here comes Aretha and we're getting on the elevator. And before he, he, she gets in, <laughs> the security turns to me and said, what floor is she going to be on? I said, on the sixth floor. She said, oh, you know, she's not going to go to the sixth floor. I said, what? She won't go to the sixth floor. I just saw her at the Four Seasons on the fifth floor. She was hanging on the patio <laughs> of her hotel room at an outdoor lobby so she could walk out. And she was walking out. I'll never forget it because she had on <laughs> pantyhose, just pantyhose, walking around and going through the lobby. So I thought, well, why is this one floor difference going to make a difference? Oh, she's not going to go up that one floor. So I found electrical tape and I took the electrical tape and I put it across the uh, the elevator where you normally look up and see the floors and I <laughs> tore that off and then on the inside of the elevator when you go on and you press the numbers I took the tape again and just <laughs> took it down so I said all right just bring Aretha on and so then they come and they bring Aretha and as we're getting in the elevator she turns to me she said what floor are we going I said we're going up Aretha <laughs> <laughs> and I press the button and we go up and when we stop and get off she looks around and she feels and we go to the room and it was Mark McEwen I'll never forget from CBS he was because he was so jolly and nice and he did the first interview and I guess we got in about 15 or 20 minutes and then all of a sudden as she walked out she started as if there was an earthquake and she could just feel the tremors in her legs <laughs> and started moving and said <laughs> No, I, I could feel it. Like she could feel the number of floors oh we were God. on. And so she shut it down. All the interviews right then, shut them oh. down. So I had to tell everybody, we'll have to reschedule. Uh, because I wasn't able to move all of the people, all the players in that short of time to another wow. floor. That was definitely not going to happen. But that's my Aretha story. So after that, great. Uh, Aretha leaves. She goes back to her suite. Um, she calls Clyde. And Clive oh. calls me and she tells Clive, or oh, her concert is that night. And she tells Clive that she's angry with me. And uh, <laughs> Clive calls me and says, Jackie, Aretha is a <laughs> just like suggest that, that's you buy that you buy her a gift. So of course, Bergdorf is across the street. I wear a uh, uh, a cologne uh, perfume by Bulgari and I love it and but I wasn't going to give her my fragrance <laughs> but I bought her the twin fragrance and oh I mean it's exquisite so I bought her a gift and I had it delivered to our hotel and then we went to the concert and the concert that night 
she got on stage and uh, before she went into it, she wanted to thank all of the people. And she said, specifically, and Jackie Reinhardt, thank you so much. And then she went on and gave a bravado performance. And Clive said later, she sounded much better. She performs well when she's angry. That was, <laughs> that was it. We said, yes, yes, she does. And so there we go. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, go ahead. I got another, another, another elevator story, a really quick one. Um, when I first got to Arisa, um, Lynn Bulkman and Melanie Rogers and Ken Reynolds were there. And there was this story about um, an after party that Clive prepared for Aretha with everybody on top of the World Trade Center. And oh, wow. nobody had no, nobody had known anything about her fear of going above the fifth floor at that point in time. So they do the concert, and then everybody jumps in the limos, and they all go downtown to the World Trade Center. And Aretha gets out, looks up at the building, and says, where, where is this party? And they're like, oh, it's on the top floor. And she's like, nope. Turns around, gets back into the car, and leaves. Meanwhile, everybody was upstairs at the party. So... And the press, and this is, see, and that's the other part of the story. And yeah. Tracy, really, you all didn't put that information in the file. There's a file on each artist <laughs> that right. we, yes. that we right, inherit Tracy. that will have their bios, other information, blah, blah, blah. So when Clive called to tell me how angry Aretha was, and he went into this story that Tracy is telling about, oh, Jack, we did a great party for her. <laughs> And it was a time, and everybody was there. Teddy Pendergrass, Teddy Pendergrass was walking in. It was all of that. Oh everybody well. was there. And the next day, the um, newspapers Ooh. wrote about the fact that Aretha never arrived, how she had stood up all of these people at mm -hmm. her own party. So I said, but Klein, that information is not in her file. <laughs> Why you did not tell anybody about that until yeah. my faux pas? Oh, come on. So that's how that happened. So that that's partially to blame for on y'all. That, that's well, that's I, I have to I have to tell and you both. You always I, I, and, and I, Jackie. Yes. Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. No, I have to tell you both that I actually was there. So here's what happened. <laughs> this was here's what happened. So this is um, Aretha had been uh, had won a Grammy. She was so it was a Radio City Music Hall. She, uh, she had won a Grammy that year. This is like the second or third year, probably about the second year she was with Arista. So, so really early, really early on, right? And um, um, and I was there with a friend of mine. We we were waiting out. We were waiting outside. I think yeah, now was let, let me ask you a question. Was the World Trade Center ever anywhere else other than downtown? Because where this building was, was literally, wherever this was, was across the street from the Ra Radio City Music Hall. That's, I'm that's, talking about that's the Rainbow Room. room. The Rainbow There's Room. There's another story yeah, about the, the Rainbow, rainbow room. Exactly, exactly. The ra anyway, yeah. so here I'm waiting with this friend of mine, and, you know, I think, well, I said, well, let's just wait till Aretha arrives. And so she literally ar arrived. I said, hello, Miss Frank. She said, hi, David. How are you? Said, I'm good. I said, well, I'll be up in a minute, you know. Oh, no, I don't was. My friend had not arrived. I was waiting for him to arrive. But I was there. And so she got in. She got into the building. And the next thing I knew, like less than five minutes later, she came out the building. And I thought, well, that's weird. She said, oh, I, 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 you know, I, I can't go all that way up there. And so then when my friend arrived, we, we went up there. And so the, the party for Aretha, there was no Aretha. So you're right, Teddy Pendergrass was there. Dion was there. I mean, it was, you know, and they were trying to find a reason to explain why she wasn't there. But then Clyde was there. And that was my first experience of Aretha would not get in the elevator. She found out what floor well, it was on the rainbow room. Like you said, it was the, the top of the uh, building. She's like, now, tell me if that's not a story that should not have reverberated through the building. It should be in the annals of history. Well, that we did not have that information you know, the, in the well, file. It should have been true. And, and the other information. Yes, yes. Yeah. The I other think information. I knew it by the time is, I got there. I think they made it clear by the time I got there. But what's also funny is Clive, used to, if she was in town and Clive was having a party at his home, which of course was the penthouse on, you know, Park Avenue and the 50, she would, he would invite Aretha and she would come to the party 
But guess where she would attend the party? In his Rolls Royce on the street. <laughs> she would literally come to the party, dress for a party. They would send the food down. They would send, and all of the guests would come one by one and get in the car with her. I'm uh -oh. not. Oh my, God. oh my God! This is the first I've ever heard of that. That is no, 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 that no, is no, hilarious. Oh my God. Karen, they would all go down and sit in the car with her. And then after their time was up, they would leave and somebody else would come down and get in the car. That is wow. that's wow. Karaoke, that is. karaoke Rolls Royce with Aretha Frank. <laughs> right. That mm -hmm. is hilarious. I wish she had, wish she had got, gotten over her fear of flying. And that's I, what I was just yeah. about to say. And been able to really enjoy touring overseas in her later mm -hmm. years because she had and such the a money. And the money. But I mean, was, money. Audrey, it wasn't, Audrey, oh, no, it wasn't just flying. Didn't we Audrey, all get it calls wasn't just, at the label? We all got calls from Europeans that wanted yeah, her to yeah. and they were offering a lot. Oh my God. Yeah. I think but I got a call. The Prince's, was... trust, the Prince's Trust, they were going to put her on the ship. Yeah. They were like, we'll send yeah. her all Absolutely. the Absolutely. The, the, yeah. the, the, the Queen Elizabeth. But she yeah. was like, nah, that's even too but high. Audrey, like, I mean, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, remember Audrey, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Audrey, it wasn't just the, it wasn't just the, the height. I mean, it was also, the air conditioner when she did concerts. Mm -hmm. I remember when she first did the, she launched the first VH1 Divas. It was built around her. Yeah. And yeah. it was at the Beacon Theater. You I guys probably that remember that. that. Yeah, That's okay, so I was, yeah. Right, yeah. I yeah. was there with her and she um, she had told me, she said, you know, Gwendolyn, make, make sure you call, um, Ken you, you know, Ken Ehrlich's yeah. office and, and make sure that they don't have the air conditioner. Now, Dick had, Dick, Dick Allen, her agent, had already mm -hmm. talked to him and told him to make sure, you know, the air is turned down, blah, blah, blah. So when we get there, she walks on stage and she felt some air mm -hmm. and she turned around and got back in her car and she said, let Ken Ehrlich know that I will be in my car for 15 or 20 minutes and they need to fix this air. So that was an ongoing situation with, yeah. with her, with performance. You know, but that's, it was, that's because it was, of the vocal cords. Oh, the boy, it's yeah. about the voice. I did it when I was still at Arista. She did a there was a show that was taping, and and this was a Tisha Fine, Ken Ehrlich, and uh, Bonnie Raitt was on the show. Mm -hmm. and it was duets. Mm -hmm. It was Aretha Franklin duets. Mm -hmm. And when we were at the rehearsals at the uh, SIR Studios, Bonnie Raitt, you know, again, you. Yeah, you're good at what you do. You're not the best. Aretha's the best. So anybody I've had, I had issues with photographers, Annie Leibovitz, we had issues with a, with a photo shoot. You're good, Annie Leibovitz. You're great even, but you're not the best. So when you are the person that's working with somebody who is the best, and that's mm -hmm. not even up for discussion. She, Aretha Franklin, is the best vocalist ever, ever. Um, you have to acquiesce a bit. You have to take the back seat. Let your ego right. as or whatever. So anyway, yeah. I'm great. Aretha walked in st on, onto the rehearsal stage at SIR and Bonnie Raitt had these fans because there was no AC and there were the oh. fans that rejected <laughs> it. She and Bonnie Raitt did not listen. So Bonnie Raitt, she, Aretha was like, these fans have to go. And Bonnie Raitt, but I'm so <laughs> hot. And she was like, this show is called Aretha Franklin Duets. Okay. Oh. And she like let her know. And then the night of the taping, this was crazy. And I feel so bad for Teddy, her son, Teddy. Um, so the night of the taping, and it was edited out. So it makes it even worse. So the night of the taping, it wasn't a live show. They go and do their song. And Aretha's still mad at Bonnie Raitt. Bonnie Raitt steps forward to do a guitar solo in the middle of the song. And out, and then steps back, and the audience is clapping for the guitar solo. And Aretha says, "Ladies and gentlemen, on guitar, my son Teddy." <laughs> oh, <laughs> and poor Teddy was like deer in the headlights, like, "Oh my God!" So Teddy's, all, it's like, "What do I do?" <gasps> he kind of awkwardly takes a bow, and it's even worse because when they edited the show, they they edit out the part where she says, Are uh, "Where Aretha says, ladies and gentlemen, on guitar, my son Teddy." So after Bonnie Raitt does her guitar solo. Teddy's bowing, so he looks crazy. Oh, I but I was like, oh my know, god, that was talked no, no. about how lovely a person she was and how generous and how gracious and how kind. But be clear, she was not one to play with. No, <laughs> so, not at all. Right. Not, 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 I, I have a story I, about that. Go, 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 go <laughs> ahead. Go, 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 go. Okay, well, here's my true story. Well, we he, were about to yeah. do her. Um, album with the roses still a rose. Um, yes, on that yes, 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 yes. She wanted to do a the Essence magazine cover. 
And Gordon Chambers had said, for Joyce, I'm sorry, they shot it down. I said, they shot down Miss Aretha on the cover? May I remind you <laughs> that without Miss Aretha paving yeah. the path, you would not have the other artists to put on your cover right. musically. So he said, I, LaJoyce, I just don't know what to tell you. So Miss Aretha kept asking me, when are we doing Essence? When are we doing Essence? She knew I was actively working on it. And then finally, I had to tell her the truth. Wow. And she said, will you please pen a letter to me, for me, on behalf of me, to the, to the chairman, mm -hmm. to the publisher? It was um, Susan Taylor, I believe, right? No, at man, the time. She said the publisher. Right. Susan was the Ed editor. Something. What was his name? Ed mm -hmm. Ed, mm -hmm. yes. Ed Lewis. Mm -hmm. So there you go. I... I wrote the letter, kill a letter, and Susan got called on it. And Susan called me, caught me in my office on a Friday night. I, I was staying late doing paperwork, and then I was going to go to the Queen of Fua sweat lodge that night. I'll never forget. <laughs> so the phone rings. My assistant's not there. I answer the phone, and it's Susan who's going to try to rip me a new behind. And I pause, I'd say, I need you to pause right there because I operate at behest of the queen. You all told her no, and I got wind of that and I had to share that information with her. Mm -hmm. And she said, I need to ask you a question. Did Aretha say no to coming to the, uh, to the Essence Festival or did her management or you all at Arista say no? And I told her, honey, have you ever worked with the queen? No one <laughs> speaks for her. Right. I could not believe I was being asked that. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, if you'll find out with me. And I'm like, are we negotiating whether or not she's coming to a concert versus being on the cover of the magazine for the release of her new album? I said, why don't we forget the whole thing? Mm -hmm. Because if I needed, and I eventually had to relay that to her because mm -hmm. she kept wanting to know the status, the status, the mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when I finally did tell her, you know what she did, you all? Hmm. Mm -hmm. But it hurt her. It Quite did. So. It yeah. did hurt it, her. But you know what? But let me say this. I had a similar story to LaJoyce, but it was with Ebony, you know, and she had how many Ebony covers over the years? And it was just during that time where, you know, you guys worked with Aretha when she was 50 and, and under. When I started working with her, she was much older. So the demos had changed and they were not putting that age group on the covers of anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was still getting the cover of Jet Magazine, but she was not getting everything. And she had another, she had an issue with that. We had to deal with a similar situation. So, you know, mm -hmm. and that's well, also the time, David, that's also the time where there was a big shift to digital. That's and true. artists of that era did not understand that. They wanted a physical, they wanted a tangible right. cover. That's you know, right. I said, well, oh, what about doing so? And they didn't understand that. But well, I, actually, I wanted to show, though, I wanted... they were right when you consider that the digital format was going to be more directed at a youthful audience. You yes. would have thought that the physical format, just as CBS Morning with Dale King, is for the older audience, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, their, their digital platform is definitely more youthful driven. Their, spoke, their people are younger on that show. But yeah. nevertheless, that would, should have been, the, you would have thought would have been their line of thinking for Essence Magazine and the mm -hmm. others. That was that was foul. They they did wrong on that. They oh, did. Absolutely. I, 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 I want to oh, go ahead, David. I, I just want to share with you when you mentioned about Bonnie Wright. So I want to share with you a story which most people don't know about because they weren't there. Uh, this is because Bonnie and I were on the board of the Rhythm and Blues Foundation, which of course mm. was started by um, actually Ruth Brown, the Atlantic artist from back in the fifties. And the whole story behind how that got started with Ahmed Erdogan. Anyway, so the Rhythm and Blues Foundation was a, an organization that Aretha loved. I mean, yeah. she loved that organization. Oh, and yes, partly, she did. And, and partly why she loved it was because it gave her an opportunity to reconnect with some of those artists that she'd been on the road with in the 60s that were not on the same you know, kind of stature, but at, at, at later in her career, 
but were her kind of people on the road. I mean, I remember you know people like Jean Chandler, and, and she would she would say, "Oh, you remember when we were on the?" I mean, she loved the Rhythm and Blues Foundation, really loved it. So this one year, and I'd have to try to remember which year it was, but it was somewhere in the it, it might have been the early two thousands. So Aretha is coming to New York because the Rhythm and Blues Foundation is giving a special award to Ahmet Erdogan. And uh, so I saw Aretha before uh, and, you know, make sure she was all right. And she was there with Ruth Bowen. And um, so, you know, she goes up and gives a speech and she knows that there are two other uh, female artists in the audience, Dion and Natalie Cole. She <laughs> knows that they're there. And so Aretha is, is up there and she's saying, you know, I did this, this organization, uh, the Rhythm and Blues Foundation has done so much for all the legacy artists, because we have been doing a, you know, a, 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 you know, doing a lot of work, you know, making sure people got financial assistance and so forth. She says, so I am going to, you know, I'm going to stand, I'm going to pledge right now, I'm pledging $50,000 to the Rhythm and Blues Foundation right here. So then she says, uh, she turns around, she looks at Ruth, <laughs> Ruth Bowen, <laughs> I was sitting next to Ruth. She said, Ruth, do you have your checkbook with you? Do you have the checkbook with you? So Ruth is like, and Ruth turns to me and says, I don't have no $50,000. <laughs> so, so she says, no, I, I, I'll, try, I'll work it out, Aretha, Aretha. So then Aretha says, okay, now I know there's a couple of other ladies in the audience, uh, Dion, Dion and Natalie. She says, uh, now, I challenge you to meet my pledge. Oh my goodness. That's you, a good know, bo- you know so they, they both just... you know they both wanted to go, <laughs> they wanted to disappear to the floor. Okay. Because the they back, didn't do nothing. The they back. didn't do they 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 did they they they, they didn't stand up, they didn't do nothing. Because the ring was like, yeah, come on now, I want to see you you meet my pledge. Well, of course she didn't pay the money that night because as she said, she didn't have the, the check. Three weeks later, this is absolutely true. Three weeks later, uh, a cashier's check arrived at the Rhythm and Blues Foundation office for fifty thousand dollars from Aretha Franklin. Come on there, Aretha. That's right. And, and you and, know and, what? Yeah, go ahead. And we didn't hear. And, and, and I'm sorry to say it. Now I know Natalie's not with us anymore, and I know Dion's the queen of Twitter, but nonetheless. <laughs> We never heard a peep from either of them, and we certainly didn't get no check. <laughs> so that's and my Aretha story Aretha, about the Rhythm and Blues Foundation, you know? I just want to say that in the Baptist tradition, that yes. is known as raising an offering. Uh-huh. Right. And he had a front row seat to doing that. Now, this is how much she loved being in the at the R&B Foundation. Yes. This mm. is she hosted one of their celebrations. This that's right. She, that's right. Yeah, one year, this was the year she did it. And yes. peeping out from behind me there is Barbara Shelley. Oh, wow. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Barbara uh, LaJoyce because she was actually the first publicist that I worked with at, at, at Arista with Aretha at, in, in 1980, 1981. Uh, and I had known Barbara wow. from before she was, um, before she was, um, uh, with Arista, she had worked with another organization, Howard Bloom organization. But anyway, so she was actually Aretha's first publicist at Arista. And, um, you know, it, they, they had an interesting relationship, you know, on and off. <laughs> but I do, I can tell you this, Barbara Shelley arranged, when uh, she wasn't at Arista at the time, she arranged for Aretha, for me to go to Detroit to do the interview with Aretha around the Who's Zoom and Who album. I had to do a bio, and uh, you know, and, and, but I, I, I do have to share one because I wanted to lead this into cooking. So I, I, want, I want us to talk about Aretha and, and cooking, but so, so, and, and one other thing. So I get to, she was living in Bloomfield Hills. The first house she got there when she moved back, had moved back to, to Detroit. And she was, you know, we were sitting in the living room and she, you know, started singing. She was singing around. She was making some food. She says, now, David, I, you, you, uh, you want some food? You, I, I'm making some spaghetti. And I said, well, Aretha, you know, I'm a vegetarian. She said, oh, yeah, just like Glenn. Glenn, who she had recently divorced. But anyway, that's the side point. She said, yeah, I used to make vegetarian, uh, you know, food for Glenn. She says, so, so, yeah, I can, make, I can make it without any, any, any meat. Uh, so there's two other parts of the story that are hilarious. So. While I'm sitting there, the phone rings, and um, 
it's Luther Vandross. And he's cornered just because he's about to come to Detroit to do a show. And uh, um, so she picks up the phone and says, hey, Luther, when are you going to be here? She says, I, 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 I've, got some, I've got some, you know, I, I, I've got this girl here in Detroit I want you to meet. Uh, you know, who, who she can make you some fat, some fantastic chicken and blah, blah, blah. So she says to me, uh, David, do you, want, do you want to say hello to Luther? Because I knew Luther from when I lived in New York. I said, hey, hey Luther, how you been? He said, Dave, he said, she keeps trying to, she keeps trying to um, hook me up with these women. And I said, I said, and I didn't say nothing. I just said, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, we're going to not go any further with that part of the conversation. But anyway, so here's the point. Arita's doing the interview with me, and she's talking about being in Detroit, and we talk about who's Zoom and who in the song. I said, well, you know, what inspired you? She said, well, yeah, I, I got, you know, I'm a single woman. I go to these clubs and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and uh, men would be really intimidated. They wouldn't really know how to talk to me. And, and then, you know, the whole Zoom and who thing. I said, okay. She said, no, what I'm really, uh, yeah, I, I, I need to find a man who will rise to the occasion. And she looked me dead in the eyes when she said it. And I knew that that was a double meaning. She wasn't just being like, so I looked at her and said, are you sure you want me to write that? And she just got forward. She said, yes. <laughs> and that was the part of Aretha that I loved. She was, you know, she could be, she was cheeky and sassy yeah. and funny. And see, that's what people don't know. They don't know that that whole part of her, and because I was like, I don't know if I could put that in print because it was kind of obvious what she was saying. But but the thing is that was also about the cooking. So that's a segue into you all telling. Let's hear stories from you about Aretha in the kitchen, or Aretha and her food, and Aretha cooking for you, or just let's hear some some food stories, ladies. Aretha and the food. Well, I re I re I just recall that. I had to always get her book. We had to work on getting her book on Emerald Live and a lot of those shows back then. And um, where they used to have the artists come on and cook and then, you know, they perform. So she enjoyed, she loved doing those shows. And it was a period, um, I guess in the nineties <clears throat> that yes. we did a lot of that, you know, but she always wanted, you know, she would do the Today Show. I remember when Matt Lauer would took up there and, you know, they asked for the recipe and then they put the recipe online and she always loved the peach cobbler and, <laughs> and, and, and the macaroni and, and, and shrimp dish and just a whole bunch of different things. And the shrimp, the shrimp a la reed. Shrimp a la reed. <laughs> yeah, the shrimp, right, the shrimp a la reed. That is hilarious. And, um, uh, you know, it got a lot of traction, of course, because they would put the, you know, the recipes on the um, internet. And that's what I remember mainly. And then she will always call around Thanksgiving. You know, you talk to her just before the holidays and she'll say, Gwen, what are you cooking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, I'm not cooking, Aretha. And then she'll talk about what she was cooking for her family. And, you know, she really loved the holidays. And mm -hmm. um she really, really loved the holidays and she loved talking about food, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure some of the other angels have some food conversations. Um, I, um, <laughs> I remember when I was one of the partners of Motown Cafe, which was on uh, 57th Street down the block mm -hmm. from Arista. And Aretha was on the road and I got this call from Hilton uh, hey Trace, you know, like we're pulling up in front of Motown Cafe in a few minutes. Aretha wants to see you and come in. And I'm like, oh shoot. So I, I ran down the block from my office over to the cafe and the tour bus pulls up in front of Motown Cafe. Everybody gets out. We set up a table for them in the whole nine and uh, they all order ribs, ribs, and ribs. So I'm sitting there and we're all talking and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, Aretha puts this like plate in front of me and they're all eating the ribs and they all start putting the bones, the empty bones on the plate in front of me. And that was like, that meant you are picking up the check because we're not paying for this. You're treating us because we stopped by. So, you know, <laughs> of course I did. Oh my God. And I, 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 the, 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 the last story that I'll, I'll say about this is when I was going to Detroit before Aretha was traveling, mm. Catherine was her cook. Catherine was also the cook for her father, Reverend C.L. Franklin. Yes. So Catherine did a lot of the cooking for the parties and for, you know, the family. 
and she was just amazing. But Aretha would always make the peach cobbler, right, Gwen? Yes, yes. But you know what? It was so funny. Robin and I remember this story um, when she was working um, up with us at the firm. And she had gone up to Valerie Simpson's place, Sugar Bar. Mm -hmm. And I remember the next day she called, she said, oh, oh, that food is so good up there. I said, oh my God, I love it. We were talking about Valerie and her restaurant for about a half an hour. Well, Valerie had promised her, Aretha had decided, Valerie had promised her that she would make a bunch of food for the tour bus to go back to Detroit. Aretha decided to leave early because she was worried about the snow and everything. So she said, call Valerie, tell her, don't worry about it. We'll, you know, we'll catch her next time. And, you know, how much we love the food, blah, blah, blah. Well, I didn't get to Valerie soon enough because her chef and the restaurant had prepared all of this food for her. I mean, it was a ton of food. And um, Aretha said, just tell her to send it to your office. I, I mean, we're leaving. We got to go. So <laughs> the food came to our office. Remember, Robin? And oh, my God, when Valerie Simpson found out that Aretha had left town after she spent all that time putting all that food together with her staff, she was not happy. But we did get the food, right, Robin? <laughs> I said, oh my God, I said, Rita, you're gonna, I, when Rita called, I said, Rita, you're gonna have to call Valerie. She was, they were not happy about this. She said, I know, I know, but we had to get back. The weather's gonna get bad on the roads and we had to get back. But that food was, you know, and then of course, at that point, Valerie couldn't ask for the food back because it was, you know, already out. Right. So, we had well, a I have a peach cobbler story. <laughs> I have a peach cobbler story. I have a fat, fantastic peach cobbler story. So here it is, it's 1980, and Aretha had signed to Arista, but she hadn't started working. You know, she hadn't started promoting, the record wasn't out yet. And so one day, I was living in New York at the time, the phone rings and, and she's on the other line. She, so she, she, I pick up the phone, she says, hi, David. I said, because I recognize her voice immediately. I said, hi, hi, hi Aretha. She says, um, <laughs> Listen, um, I, I've got a new album coming out on Aris. Do you know I signed to Aris? I said, yeah. She said, I'd love you to hear it. I, I said, okay. Well, I said, she said, can you come out to LA? I said, well, yeah, sure, absolutely. I'd love to, you know, I want you to hear it first before, before it comes out and, you know, we do an interview and stuff. So I said, all right. And she was living in Encino at the time. So I said, well, but the only thing is I, I have a condition. So, you know, hear this silence of the, the, the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is it? I said, well, you know, I've heard so much about your peach cobbler. I, I, I've, so, for so many years, I've been hearing about your peach cobbler. So I will come out to LA, but only if you will make me some peach cobbler. So she said, okay, so let me know when you're going to be here and blah, blah, blah. So we said that all up because um, I basically was paying for the trip. There wasn't at that point, she, you know, she wasn't with Arista officially, so nobody had, I had to find that, you know, get out there myself. Anyway, so I get out there, and I'm staying somewhere in, in San Fernando Valley, and I call her up, um, say, make sure that we're on for the, for, the, for the interview that evening. She said, yeah. I said, now, you, you did remember, don't, didn't you? And she said, you mean the peach cobbler? I said, mm-hmm. She said, okay, yeah, it's here. So off I got in the taxi, got to Encino, you know, and uh, so I go in and she says, uh, hi, David, hi, how you doing? I said, uh, she said, now, do you want the peach cobbler first? So she would do, do, do you want the music first? And the I said, well, let, let me have a little bit of the peach cobbler first. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I could get into it. <laughs> and then we, we did the interview and she was still, at that point, still married to Glenn. So he was in the living room and we would just sit there talking and, Played the music and I made notes and everything about the album and uh, and so you know we started talking about TV and things she was watching on TV and all. Anyway, so it's time for me to go, and I said uh, I said well can can I ask you for what, one more thing? She said what? I said well could, could I get a doggy bag? <laughs> <that piece>? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know how Aretha got uh huh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I left. I, I left that I left that uh, that interview. I think I still have the the cover of Blues and Soul. Oh, yeah, Lady Soul Cooks. <laughs> oh, wow. I love that. That's the United Together. 
That's the yes, United States. United, era. exactly. That was exactly the time. I know that so, picture. You know, so I did have, I did get to sample Miss Aretha Franklin's That's a great album. album. And I, that's one of my biggest achievements in life. I'm telling you. The Angels, what about like her favorite restaurants in New York? You all have stories about Shun Lee, oh, yeah. Laverna Dan, and, and um, Gwen. I know you yes, have stories ma'am. about that. Wait, I want to I wanna tell you this cooking story. Yeah. Not yeah. only did she like to cook, she also liked to do her own grocery shopping. Oh. I, I was with her at her home for the farewell on the Today Show of Bryant Gumbel. Mm-hmm. And before everybody came well they wanted her to come to new york and it was so last minute that she told them no because she couldn't get the bus going that quickly but they could come to her home well they sent an entire crew (laughs) to her home to set up the whole cable the generator the truck outside the whole nine yards to be outside she invited over a few friends so i got there really early in the morning and she was in the kitchen preparing hors d'oeuvres for the friends, for friends and the crew. And she realized she didn't have something. And she said, oh, I need to go to the store. And I said, okay, come on, I'll drive you. She looked at me, you know, you know the look, y'all. She said, get in the car. And we drove to the store and she just shopped around and people didn't bother. Hi, Rita, hi, Rita, hey, hey. (laughs) And we got, and I, here I am trying to be of service and do things to her. And she was like, if you don't, just move out the way and you know so I I was awed by that and then when we got back to the house she had was baking this date nut bread so she took the date nut bread that was in that were it was baked in a loaf pan and then she sliced it bread in half like a pound cake and then cut it in quarters and arranged it on a tray and then she said uh this is the best thing you've ever had so I reached for a piece of the date nut bread she was like not yet like not not, not yet doing what I have to do to the date nut bread. So then she took this whipped cream cheese and put the whipped cream cheese on the date nut bread. And then my face went and she said, don't knock it. They said, one more thing. Then she took these sliced green olives and placed it on top of the cream cheese. Then she came to my mouth and popped it in and then closed my mouth. And I was like, (laughs) oh my God, the combination. That's crazy. Flavors. It was so good. And anytime I get a chance to make it, I do. Because oh. that was, and then we just had them out on the tray. And then the men who were putting the cables all over the place and the one man who was assigned to run the thing out the back door by the kitchen, he got to sample it when it was nice and warm and toasty. Oh my ah. God, so good. Yeah. And she, and with her shrimp a la riz, one more thing with that shrimp a la riz, when I had it on the, <laughs> shrimp a la riz, on the, uh, Rolanda Watts show one time and the bus did come in and she was very specific about her ingredients. The garlic sock by Laurie's with the green top. <laughs> right? And so then the, the PA who was running around looking for butter when she, before the show began Miss Aretha looked at everything to make sure and she looked at the butter and she went like that's not what I ordered up. She said, I need Fleischmann's butter. And the little girl came and said, oh, but I couldn't find any. My margarine is margarine, isn't it? She looked at her. She said, I'll be, the little girl, the little girl put on her coat and said, I'll be right back. <laughs> and she ran until she could find the Fleischmann's butter. But she wow. also made sh- shrimp a la riz for the day for the farewell for the Bryant Gumbel show because she said when her friends come over, they always want to have the shrimp a la riz. And here we are at her living room. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. The, the, uh, I think that's very special that, you know, when you go to someone's home and then they, they know that there's going to be specifically one thing on the menu without fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's the same thing like Tracy just mentioned. Um, what was that restaurant Tracy on the East side? It was another French restaurant. I know the Bernardin was on the West side and Shungli and no, LeBron. Yeah, I know. The one on um Cluster. Yeah. I can't remember the name. Um but Joyce, but she would always invite all of us out. Le, you know, so Grenouille, Le Grenouille. Wait, Le Grenouille, the Le, Le Grenouille. I can't, my friend. I, I spoke I took Spanish. Le Grenouille. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was always great because you know, Aretha, mm-hmm. you know, when she stopped drinking, if you worked with her, you knew not to drink around her. 
That's right. So we'd be at these really nice restaurants and they have these big, huge flower arrangements. And I would either sit at her table or sit at a table next to her. And I was always, not always, a couple of times I managed to order a drink. Yeah. And put, it right, put it right in front of the boss. And security, Hilton would say, Gwendolyn, you know better than that. I said, she won't see, she won't see. And um, I remember all of that. She just loved going, dining in New York, going to the plaza, to the, have a tea, tea sandwiches and, or yes. the Ritz Carlton in the lobby. It was high all tea. She loves the high tea, right? High tea. High, high, tea. Tea. high tea. Yep. high tea with the queen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see with the queen. And she said, can you come down? She said, you and Robin could join us. And we would run right on over to the, <laughs> to the plaza yeah. or to the risk yeah. I want to ask David a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great time. Yeah. I want to ask David something. Um, I just want to yes. turn it back to the music and this box set. Yeah. And Gwendolyn sent me a, a, a copy of it. And thank you, Gwendolyn. And I, I, I'm, David, I was blown, blown away. <laughs> blown away by the liner <laughs> like i'm just all like did you have how did this project fall into your lap and and what yeah. did you know did you write everything like did you have any say in curating and picking the two absolutely tune? absolutely so how did wow that, did you? you did your yeah. thing with this david like honestly well, yeah. as someone yeah. who is is you know a huge fan of her music not just as somebody mm -hmm. who worked with her but mm -hmm. i was a fan before i met her and remain a fan yeah. i know her work i know her work from the columbia years yes the gospel, yes all yes yes i was just looking at the the, the, the song selection is out of control it's mm -hmm. it's perfect mm -hmm. And the well, line, it's yeah. just, it's beautifully written. It's it's Pulitzer Prize winning material. Well, I uh, hope so. Gra you know it's Grammy winning with material. Yes. Yes. You know what, Audrey, you, I mean, Audrey is right. You guys should make sure they submit for a Pulitzer. I mean, seriously. Yeah, well, it's, seriously. it's funny. Can you just tell us how did this work? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. So, 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 I mean, I had my history with um, um, being a, an Aretha, uh, Aretha tape archaeologist, so to speak, uh, goes back um, to like 2005, uh, around about that time, um, when I lived in Los Angeles and Rhino Records, which was owned, uh, you know, controls the Atlantic Warner Electric Catalog division of Warner Music Group, had hired me to, um, to go through the vaults. So that's how far back it goes, to the tape library in, in Burbank, because what had happened, they had moved all the Atlantic Records tapes to Burbank and a lot of them had not been cataloged properly okay. and they just they didn't have them in the database and the computer so my job I mean you talk about a dream job so for weeks weeks I had to go to the Burbank you know, tape library and literally walk down the aisles of all the aisles and find every box with Aretha Franklin's name on it now what they didn't have there were the actual Finnish masters because they were in, in a secure location. So they didn't have the original albums because they had to re preserve those in a separate place. But they had all the tape, is that tape boxes, like yeah. outtakes and, and all kinds of, you know, you know, session reels from about 1972 onwards. So I'm going down these aisles and, 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 and what they would do is I put all the tapes on a, on a trolley they would take them to the studio and then they would transfer them so that we could hear what they were because a lot of times you didn't know what they were. And um, so that was the beginning of me being an arethacologist as an archaeologist, so to speak. I will share one thing with you, which is, which is unbelievable. So there was one box. Some of this is actually on the box set. A couple of the tracks are on the box set. There was this one tiny box and it was just on a shelf and it didn't have any proper labeling on it. And I looked at the front of the box and it said, uh, Jerry Waxler, I didn't say Jerry Waxler, Jer Jerry Waxler <laughs> Ted, from Ted White, and it had the address in Detroit. But no idea what's in the box. And they send the box over to be transferred. And in the box is home demos that Aretha did in 1966 after she had signed to Atlantic. Jerry Wexler wanted to get an idea of well, what kind of things you want to do and blah, blah, blah. So there's home demos. And some of the demos included the first demo of uh, I Never Loved the Man, Where I Love You, which of course became her first massive Atlantic hit or first massive hit. Uh, and then uh, a few other things, um, including 
Um, because Aretha did like to do show tunes. I don't care what people say it was Columbia, blah blah. No, it was Aretha Franklin who liked doing the show tunes. It was not Columbia telling her you have to do them, blah blah blah. So Broadway. The, okay. And on the tape was um a version of Try Little Tenderness, which she had done mm -hmm. at Columbia, mm. another version of it. Uh, she, it was just like there's her and a bass player and a drummer on the session. And uh she had this track, she did My Kind of Town, which is the Frank Sinatra song, but she did it as My Kind of Town Detroit is, and she makes these little references to the Four Tops and the Miracles. So, of course, <laughs> they transferred all this material, and some of it came out in different compilations. So, when it, so to fast forward, Audrey, so I had really been steeped in the Aretha, you know, tape library and stuff like that. So, in 2018, you know, after, after she got made, transition, um, Rhino approached me and they said, well, you know, we, we really want to keep her legacy alive. We want to do some stuff with her legacy. We know that you know her catalog, like inside out. All right now, yes. So I said, um, yeah, absolutely. So they hired me to, all right now, showing all the, showing all the pieces. <laughs> so they hired me to, to work as a consultant and um and we decided they decided that you know especially in in line with with the with the um genius project that was being talked about uh that they wanted to do a box set and we said what we would do is um we would do a complete career retrospective not just atlantic but everything and it took um it took the best part of a year to license everything because you know we got some really rare stuff on there. So and I said, well, let's not just do the usual greatest says, let's find pieces that demonstrate Aretha's artistry. Not just the hits, but let's put the songs on there, but let's show Aretha at work. So some of the pieces that are on this box set, of which I'm most proud of the way she's working out a song. So we've got a few things like that like a brand new me, you hear it kind of working out how the song is going to go. Um, then the, the one that I love is, is Angel. So we have a version of Angel where she's starting to work on it and then she turns around to the musician and says, no, you've no, you got to come in where I do the turnaround. I mean, all that kind of studio chatter. And, you know, for me, it's, and also the, the version of Somewhere, which she did with Quincy Jones, where you can hear her when she's working out the piano part and, and, and it's just why what, what I told Patrick the guy who worked with me Patrick Milligan I said what we what we must do is show Aretha Franklin the musician we know she's yes. a great singer we know that people know that they know that mm -hmm. she is um you know a genius when it comes to interpretation of song you know there's no one who interprets a song like anyone else but people forget that this is a musician and she you know so i we made sure that some of those tracks actually focus on that aspect of her artistry and um so one other thing to say about that is i was talking to someone recently and i said you know they said well who who else you know in aretha's peers i mean who who are I said, well, there isn't anyone else. I mean, Gladys mm. Knight doesn't play the piano. Dion doesn't play. The, I mean, Dion plays the piano, but she doesn't play it professionally. But, you know, Patty, you know, they're singers and there's nothing to take away. No, I'm not taking anything away from them. I'm just saying what this, what made Aretha separate from everybody was she was a musician. Right. And she drove those early Atlantic recordings. She's the one showing the rhythm section what to do they didn't tell her what to do she, in fact it's famous on the i never love the man. <laughs> exactly you know that she she showed up at you know fame studios in alabama and she sat at the piano and she said this is how it's gonna go and they just fell in and they were all like who is this because at that point she wasn't really you know, known like a, as a mainstream artist so so i wanted to make sure that that was focused on 
And then we got some great duets on the her with Smokey Robinson being in the video of her and Smokey Robinson. If you look at it, it was on Soul Train. You can see oh, it on YouTube. Oh my God, it is that was so amazing. funny. And they are so they are so being so like flirty with each other. The Rita just I, you know what I loved about Rita. She took you look like kind of coy and being all kind of like <laughs> and you see that in the video of her with Smokey. And then there's a duet of her and Dion with I Say a Little Prayer, about which we won't say much else other than you should listen to it, but not necessarily look at the video. Anyway, moving along. <laughs> so we, well, we well, tell, us, tell, yes. tell us about the nomin the um, Grammy nomination that you're under consideration yeah. for. Well, you know, after, after we finished the box set, the box set was supposed to come out in 2000, uh, you know, nine, uh, 20, 2020, came out this year. And I don't have anything to do with the submission pro process. But Rhino right. did submit it for historical album, for liner notes, and for uh, packaging, I think, the three pack three uh, categories. And, um, you know, the, the only other thing I want to say, so, you know, we'll find out on Tuesday if it's been nominated. Uh, I don't know yet. We'll find out on Tuesday. I'll find out at the same time you all do. But here's the thing I want to say. As far as the notes are concerned, Audrey, I mean, I, I really, and everyone, I, I kind of, I didn't want to just write the usual old, you know, this happened and that happened. And um, the best way I can describe how those no notes were written is they were very kind of stream of consciousness. Mm. And I just, I just tuned into my experience of Aretha as a, as, as a, as a person and, and that relationship. And I, I just, I don't know how to explain what happened. It, it just kind of wasn't, it wasn't like anything else I ever wrote. Oh, well, it's clear that it was um, from a place of love, David. And, yeah, and absolutely. It, it, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have, yeah. To say, yeah, I, I have to say that, you know, when I look back at my own life and my career and everything that's happened, you know, Aretha is the through line of my entire life. And, mm. and I mean that in terms of in music. Mm -hmm. Because while I might have known and been somewhat closer to somewhat closer to some of the other artists, I could not say hand on heart that I would consider any of them like a friend in the way that Aretha was, you know, really. And, and, and we had some funny moments, especially toward the end, you know, her, in the last few years of, of, her, of her being here, that I could never, I will never share them in, in print form. Or, 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 or in any other way, because they were so funny. I would just say this. Aretha would call up and she'd say to me, hey, David. Hi, Aretha. What's the gossip? <laughs> and I would yeah, say, that was she I don't know any gossip, Aretha. I don't know any gossip. I don't, you know, I'd be kind of like, I don't know what to talk about. I don't know. She said, come on now. I know you know gossip. I know you do. I know you do. She said, she would ask me about certain people. She said, well, what have you heard about so-and-so? And I'd say, uh, what are you trying to what are you trying to ask me Aretha? what are you trying to ask you know and Who she loved it? that Who it too? I, I did not have that kind of relationship what's the 411 anybody okay, yeah what's else? the 411 but let me That's just say right. this David let me just say this David congratulations you know when after Aretha passed and um I started working with the state immediately after that Rhino you were already working with Rhino at that That's time right. But That's they, right. you know, they called and say, well, you know, working with you. And we were like, hands down, there is no one else out there, no other journalist other than David Nathan that knows uh -huh. Aretha, not only her, but her music, you know, and um, I'm just so happy for you because Thank you. you've never been Thank nominated you. for a Grammy. And I hope this, you know, uh, well, I hope this I, turns I into a nomination. Yeah. Well, I think it would be kind of like, you know, I would just say that that would be like, like the, the, the icing on the cake. So it's the jewel in the yeah. crown. I mean, you know, I, 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 also, I also know that, you know, I just have to not be all like, for God, it must get a grave. It's like, look, if that's what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. And, and, and I just consider that just even the opportunity of doing this box set, regardless of Grammy nomination or not. Is, is yes like the is is really is the kind of jewel in the crown for me for my entire work and my whole career. Yes. I mean, there's nothing I could do at this point that would top that. Yes, no. and I think, you know, I think all of us give you our vote. Definitely. Well, thank you. Okay.
It that. really does position you, David, as the foremost leading journalistic expert on all things Aretha Franklin. Yes. Aretha, exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I think we're, we're we're almost coming to that uh, time time of the of our of mm -hmm. our wonderful event together. Robin, did you ever fix your thing? <laughs> did you ever oh. fix the? Oh. oh well, we got to see you, Robin, and we didn't get Robin to hear you. Wait, is such where a we go? We've got to uh, talk about teaching Aretha how to text. Gwen. Oh, 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 oh Tracy, Tracy, Tracy. <laughs> I tell you what. I tell you what. I tell you what. I still have. I still have. Not in my phone, but I still have in my in my computer. One of my computers. I still have t emails from Aretha, which I will no one will ever see. But they are yes. they're all in upper upper K, all upper all, all you know, cats, all cats. All cats. And some of them are so funny. I mean, they are hilarious. And yes, but when Aretha, when Aretha found, um, you know, as you said, te you tell us, what was it like when Aretha found <laughs> technology? We, we, we taught her how to text, which was a good no, and a you bad taught thing. her how to text. <laughs> and Aretha always had, like, she always perfectly manicured her nails, right? Beautiful nails, beautiful hands. And she would get on the phone and she would start texting and she would like miss all of these letters. But in her mind, she's like talking about it and she's texting and you would get the text and you'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, know what you know what is so funny because Tracy is so right. You have people like Matt, Michael Eric Dyson calling us. They wanted us to like, you know, what is she really saying? Transcribe the conversation. <laughs> Translate, translation, please. You and Gwen speak Riri language. Oh it was hilarious, man. And we, you know, I, I remember when computers first came out. She said, "I'm not. I don't want a computer in my house." Yeah, and then it took a while for her to get. But once she got started with that, forget it. We used to complain about faxing all the time, but I tell you, when Tracy started that whole, the text went to. I think it was text and then email. Yeah. She started doing the emails, and that oh, was yes. really interesting as well. And, she and did the email first, and now she did the oh, email did the first, email first question, remember? Yeah. And then she, then we taught her how to text. <laughs> that was a big mistake. And, and then and Facebook and then on social media. Oh my! Oh my! Oh and then oh, wait a minute. She would wait write minute. things and send them to us, and she would send them to to me and Gwen and to to whomever. And you would get them and then you would try and like, you know, transcribe it and translate it and, you know, but don't send it back to her because then she was like, that's not what I said. I said this. <laughs> and it'd be like, Louisa, it doesn't make any sense that don't tell me I know. <laughs> so, let me tell you something else. One day she was telling me all. She sent me it and she thought she was sending me an email. That's when she got exposed to Facebook. Oh. And she... <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> it was crazy. She told me off on, and she thought she was, I think she thought she was sending, she knew it was Facebook, but she thought it was a private message. Oh no. <laughs> I got up that morning and I was reading my texts, I mean, my Facebook messages, and I was, my hands started shaking. <laughs> and I called oh. the lady who I brought in and said, did you see? She said, oh my God, yes, I saw that, but I didn't know what to do. I said, girl, if you don't pull that shit down right now from Facebook, we're going to have a major problem. Oh, but she, wow. so yeah, so that was the danger. Yeah. Because she wasn't just telling me all, she was telling other people all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, like I said, when you, you missed that part. It was, it was dreadful. Yes. Girl. Well, when you're that ladies, talented, you yeah. can get away with that kind of behavior. Yeah. That's just how I No, was. no, we took the Facebook uh, permission away from her, and we were the only ones that yeah. were allowed to use that was it. Not because, like, that was not yeah. yeah. Well, that kind ladies, of we're, we're, we're coming to the, to the end of our, uh, end of our <laughs> wonderful session. Um, I, I don't know. I was just saying, last thoughts, but we're about to, we're about, it, the, the, the um, what's the game? Zoom is about to, Fire. Click off. So I just oh, want to yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been such a delight. Well, you, and David. I know all the Aretha, uh, the people who love Aretha, are, are going to love this because it really gives them an insight 
into the woman, not just the recording artist, but the person that we all work with and that we all got to know and love. And so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm just so thrilled to be with the Reaper's Angels. Oh, thank you, David. And we're, we're thank rooting you. for you. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Thank you, David, and good luck. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. All right, then. Okay, now. See you all. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.